The next talk is about possible model computation and revision, a practical approach by Peter Baumgartner. Hi, my name is Peter Baumgartner, and I will talk about a logic programming based approach and implementation for a certain application area. The main application area of our approach is situational awareness, which is the problem of being able to comprehend the current state of a system as the system has evolved over time and at a level that makes sense to human decision makers. Applications include factory floor operations and for us more recently food supply chains where goods are moved around the food chain and we would be interested in answering questions like why is the truck late or what's the expected quality of the goods. Another not so obvious application is for data cleansing. So this is a difficult problem for various reasons. First and foremost, there's a mismatch between the events that happened and the events that have been reported, this way blurring the picture of the accurate situation. GPS sensors may drop out, paper-based work may come late or not be filled out at all, databases may be incorrect and things like that. We are dealing with that with a very simple belief revision operator. Then we need to integrate various information sources like sensor data, databases, maps, and a semantic domain model in order to answer questions like we above, why is the truck late? Has it been stuck at a boom gate or has it broken down on the highway somewhere? We are dealing with this with a logic programming approach. And then it will not be possible to recover the ground truth from this blurred event sequence and from the possibly fuzzy domain model. So the best we can hope for is a set of plausible explanations. And these will be computed as the models of a logic program. So in the rest of the talk, I will explain all that in more detail. First, I would like to illustrate a bit more the mentioned event reporting problem. This slide has a toy example from a food supply chain with implausible event reporting and how our system fixes that. So suppose that report events tell us that at time 10, tomatoes were loaded on a pallet. At time 20, the pallet was loaded onto the container. At a time 40, the container was loaded on the ship. Then there's a period of silence. And at time 16, we were reported that at apples were unloaded from the pallet. Now this is in a practical sense in unsound and incomplete because tomatoes loaded and apples unloaded does not go well together. And also one would expect that the loading events should be undone by corresponding unload events in reverse. This has not happened. But this is exactly what our system proposes, is one possible course of events that uh, the unsoundness is fixed uh, in the way uh, shown here. And also these missing events of the unloading have been inserted. But that is not, only the, not the only uh, plausible explanation that our system computes. It also returns alternatives that talk about apples only, or another way to fix it is to say, okay, both tomatoes and apples have been loaded, but the apples have been unloaded. Next, I want to show you a logic program that expresses this fixing. A logic program has two parts. In one part, it defines an in relation, and in the second part, it defines integrity constraints and revision operation. The in predicate has a time argument, like all others as well, which expresses the current time point. The first rule just says if an object was loaded into a container at a certain time, then it is in that container. The second rule is just a transitivity rule for the in relation. The third rule is a bit more interesting. It's a frame axiom for the in relation, and it tells us under what conditions a current instant of an in relationship carries over to the next time point where a step relationship gives that next time point. And that happens if neither the object is unloaded from a container nor an object that contains that object is unloaded from the container. This is expressed in these two default negation literals here, which are evaluated, of course, over a closed world assumption, as this is a knowledge representation exercise. Integrity constraints. The first rule is standard and expresses that no unload of an object can happen unless that object was loaded at some earlier time point. Notice a variable t here, which is existentially quantified within the scope of a default negation, so this is not propositional logic. The second rule is also an integrity constraint, but it is of a new form. 
we call it a fail head. Fail heads are responsible for fixing the event stream. In the example, it, the rule applied by replacing the unloading of tomatoes by unloading of apples. And this is expressed by corresponding signs. Such a rule is applied as any other rule if the body um, is satisfied, which in this case expresses plausible conditions on the history so that this replacement of the unloading actually makes sense. In the rest of this talk, we will look into all of that in a little bit more detail. I will argue that the situational awareness task can be expressed as a stratified model computation task, which has two components, logic programs and a belief revision. I will bring these two things together and talk about a little about the semantics of this combination. Then I turn to the practical side of things. Uh, the calculus and proof procedure shows no big surprises and it can actually be implemented by an embedding into the Scala programming language, which has some quite attractive features and it leads to a nice method, I think, uh, to do this kind of logic programming in practice. In this slide, I want to take a general view at situational awareness and make the point that our approach matches its requirements well. Quite trivially, only the past and the now is available to comprehend the current situation, but not the future. That is, we can assume stratification of knowledge by time points 0, 1, 2, and so on, where nothing can become true in retrospect. This is actually an important postulate as it makes default negation possible in the first place, as quantification over what is known up to now is finite and will not change as time proceeds. A second kind of stratification distinguishes between events and conclusions derived from these events. I use the notions of extensional and intentional database for that. At the current stage of developments, only revisions of the EDB are possible. Because EDB facts are not derived, revision is actually very simple and amounts to addition or removal only. Taking these two aspects of stratification together, the model computation as implemented in our approach can be summarized as in the following pictures, but ignoring the revision aspect of it for now. So stratification by time means we are presented with a sequence of EDBs, E0, E1, E2, and so on, and say the current time is zero. Derived from E0 is by application of a logic program until fixed point, the IDB I0. At the next time point, E1, the procedure repeats, and I1 is computed from the information available so far, that is E0, E1, I0. And it goes on, E2, derives I2 from all the information that is available so far, and so on. Uh, from the postulate above, it follows that these arrows can only go to the right, down, but never go to the left. In the next slide, I will show the stratified logic programs for computing these models. On this uh, slide, I talk about the shape of uh, logic programs. Logic programs consist of rules <coughs> over literals of the form as here, so we have a head, a positive body, and a negative body for default negation. And in order to realize what I talked about in the previous slide, a couple of syntactic restrictions are in place, which are summarized here. But I will not talk about these restrictions in detail. Instead, I will just summarize what they uh, accomplish. The first restriction accomplishes a range restriction, which means that every variable in the head of a rule also occurs as a free variable in the body uh, of a clause. And that has the effect that model computation will be simple in the sense that for a given set of ground facts, only ground facts can be derived from that. <clears throat> then stratification by time is uh, accomplished by um, putting in a dedicated time variable in all the literals here, which will, you will see with this um, 
examples below and with this additional restrictions here it uh, will be made sure that model computation will be effective in the sense that only the past and the now will be needed to compute the current state but not the future and there is some other restrictions in place which avoid guessing whether the head is true or false in the final model at the current layer. So this is also more of a practical uh, consideration here and it avoids actually computing um, answer set as models, but uh, this is not necessary. No, so no, no guessing is, is necessary. Uh, by way of examples, so the first rule here, that is okay, where i and j are IDB uh, predicates and time is a designated time variable here. So we all talk about the same time point, that is fine. And the free variable x occurs in the x here. So when evaluate, evaluated bottom up, this x will be bound to a ground term and propagated to the head. The next rule in uh, difference has a time variable t here, but that is fine because the t must be before or equal to the current time point t. Here's one with default negation. Um, we have that there is the time point t here, but that is fine because t must be earlier than the time quantified over in this positive body literal here. So no way to escape to the future, so to speak. And evaluation can be done with a closed world assumption by matching. If, uh, say, E union I is for current partial interpretation and one is to evaluate a body atom, not body with a free variable X, then this then amounts to um, grounding out this X over the existing partial interpretation up to that time and checking if there's a, a matching instance and deciding that not exists in this way. And that is fine because of uh, less here and this is an IDP atom. Um, however, instead, if we had uh, less or equal, that would not be fine because the I instance, an I instance might derive later in the sense for computation, not in the sense of time and invalidate that the default conclusion here. But for EDP atoms, if there is a not E uh, of the same time point, that is fine because uh, EDB literals cannot be derived. So here is a closer look to these integrity constraints. They come in two forms. One form of integrity constraints is of a classical way, where you have an empty head or a fail head here. And we generalize it in this work for the purpose of revising EDB literals. So the fail heads may have arguments minus EDB literal or plus EDB literal here and a usual body here, such that the conditions very similar to those on the previous slide apply, and it must also be timed. So this EDB literal modifications may have a time point less than the current time point. It's about fixing the events from the past. Here's an example. We've seen that before in the very first slide. That's the rule here. So it says the unload has to be removed and that unload instance instead has to be put in place. And the example for that was where the apples unloading was replaced by the tomatoes unloading. Um, the semantics of that is uh, given or indicated here. So if you have a current um, uh, partial model consisting of an EDB and an IDB and uh, the body of that fail rule here is satisfied under the closed world assumption, or rather there is an instance by means of a matcher sigma here, such that the body is satisfied, then in operational terms, so to speak, this fail rule can fire and it does exactly as prescribed. So it removes the uh, instance of the minus literal here from the EDB and it adds the plus EDB literals here in terms of instances. Okay. That's what it does. This slide puts the semantics of the fail rules in context with the regular logic program rules. And the easiest way to explain the model computation is perhaps by using this diagram here, 
where uh, each tree in this diagram represents the model computation for a fixed EDB, which happens by stratification of time. So you pick an EDB and you pick a certain time step, say now, and the model computation starts, that is, the rules are uh, applied until the saturation, which may leave some models here. Uh, computed while other branches may derive fail heads, ordinary fail heads, which are model candidates which are just abandoned, or it may lead to instances of fail heads which prescribe modification to the current EDB in it, which are then uh, carried out and the loop continues with a new model computation for the modified EDB. And that all here is summarized in this procedure here. Um, one thing to note is that the model computation can actually branch out like here and like here because the heads of the rules can actually be disjunctive and lead to multiple uh, possible models then of course another fact to notice is that the fail occurs as early as possible and once a certain time point fails a model candidate for a time point fails it will be given up it will not be explored further and also all possible fails are collected. This, the attention is to just not forget one possible reason uh, why a model may have failed and so to be sure that all uh, fixes will be collected as we go. That was very op uh, operational of course but the paper also has a more declarative version of this semantics here. In terms of the rest of this talk graph, we are about here, I would say. Oh, I explained or I indicated the calculus and the proof procedure on the previous slide, mm, wanting to make the point there are no bigger surprises uh, in that. And now I will talk about the practical side of things, which is the embedding into the Scala programming language. Here is how the model computation of the previous slide is actually implemented. It is implemented by a shallow embedding in a host programming language, which is Scala in this case. Shallow embedding means that uh, the input program, the logical rules, are actually Scala source code, which are dealt with some syntactic sugar around it and some library code to be written. Um, the little table there is helpful to explain what's going on. Um, the logic concept of predicate and functional signature is translated as a class definition. So Scala is an object-oriented and functional language. It has the notion of classes. An interpretation in the logic sense is a set of instances over these classes. A variable remains a variable of a programming language. A rule is translated into a partial function. And applying um, a rule or evaluating a rule over a, um, a given set of facts requires a matching substitution which is uh, mapped to a pattern matching of this partial function against the current set of facts and, and evaluating it. Uh, by way of example, this is how it looks like. So there's a type time to be fixed, which in this case are the integers, but one might realistically use a a Java daytime format for that. And here are the class, class uh, definitions for the EDB atom load and similarly for the in, in the concrete syntax here, extending an atom. So we say that, make it known to the system that this is a, a logical concept here. Then we want to write or define rules in this natural syntax here. But the problem is that um, this uh, Scala compiler cannot accept it, it is syntactically incorrect, but that can be dealt with by providing a little annotation here and writing a macro that expands it into these partial functions. So what in this case will happen is uh, that this rule here is translated into this partial function which is indicated by a case statement here. So here is the template to match against and that uh, template here corresponds to the positive body of this rule here and as a little technicality the pattern must be linear so it cannot contain the same variable twice which is why the second occurrence of time has been renamed apart and the equality has been put as a constraint in the guard here 
and similarly for the C. So that's the partial function. If that template matches um, to a given set of facts, then it can be executed and it uh, returns that instantiated uh, class instance here, which is actually, of course, the rule of the head here. This is how that works in principle, plus some uh, library code that uh, evaluates uh, the partial functions on a current given uh, partial interpretation and saturates it and does all the things that need to be done as per the previous slide. One final comment is that in reality the macro expansion is more complicated because of default negation. Default negation would be included as part of the if condition here and it needs to be passed the current interpretation through the pattern matching. That can be done in a way but I will not explain that. Defining a logic programming language and writing an interpreter for it is one thing, but making it ready for practical use is a different thing. What I'm thinking of is providing a development environment and infrastructure around it so that real-world libraries can be coupled in an easy way, for example. Fortunately, the approach taken by means of shallow embedding makes it very easy to integrate logic in a very natural way into the Scala programming language and its programming environments. And this is what this slide is about. By way of example, suppose that we're given a list of CSV entries, like those in the first line here, and we want to manipulate those. The first thing would be to convert it into a list of logical atoms, which thanks to logic programming operators like map and pattern split matching and other library procedures can be done in a straightforward way. In fact, it's just a one-liner here that does this conversion. Next comes the application of the logic programming system in the form of this saturate operator, which is the one that is provided by our system here, it's a new thing, which means to apply a set of rules to a collection of atoms, which is expressed in this example here, just by giving one of these rules that you've seen earlier. Once the models are computed by means of a saturate operator, then comes the Scala map again, which takes all these interpretations in separation, converts them to a list and sorts them by the time. So this is also part of a Scala library. It's just given and does some filtering of those, uh, collects say, the load and the unload events from the model and then uh, computes the result actually, which is given in small letters just here. The point to make is that it's really a two-way combination from Scala to rules, like here, but also from the rules back to Scala by means of, for example, this their operator here, which allows to embed arbitrary Scala code and to call, say, Scala-defined uh, Scala function, same batch on T, and which would deliver some results. Scala like a set of strings here, which then in turn can be used in the rule body as a within a Scala impression for Boolean evaluation here. In the talk, I wanted to make the point that the problem that we framed as situational awareness can be appropriately dealt with in a time stratified logic programming setting in combination with a simple belief revision operator. The approach was meant to be practical in the sense that it is embedded in a real-world programming language and development environment, that the logical language can deal with structured data, not just uh, propositional logic, and the reasoning is actually quite controllable regarding complexity. The paper has some more things that I did not talk about. Um, it has in particular a generalization towards disjunctive heads, that is, I can write rules like those. If I get up in the morning, then I'm hungry or thirsty or both. And this inclusive semantics is actually compatible with uh, Scala, uh, with embedding into, into Scala. And it's uh, well known from, from the literature. Uh, the paper also has a partial correctness result regarding soundness and completeness, model completeness uh, for the proof procedure. There's a lot of things to be done. Um, one thing would be to generalize the 
two-layer EDB IDP stratification so far to arbitrary many levels. It's well known how that is to be done and that is already implemented. Then there's also classical negation on offer. It's strong negation as it is called in a logic programming uh, setting. Then not implemented or not further looked into is proper belief revision that not only um, EDB atoms can be revised but also IDB atoms. Um, but more pressing possibly is to work with uh, a combination of uh, uh, LTL. It would be attractive and straightforward to add a timed LTL where you can talk explicitly about time to the picture as a further constrained language and also to add some probabilities to the picture where you say that this loading event has a probability of 0 0.3. It's also possible to follow um, known paths. Problog would be one such language that uh, enables doing that, but we would add revising the, also the uh, probabilities of such EDB atoms, say so that you might have better confidence in something to hold. But for now, that's it. If you wanted to try uh, the implementation, it is freely available at the web address given there. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we already have some questions. Um, uh, Ulrich Fuba is asking if you, all the models you are creating are finite. Yes. All right. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, uh, you are... Um, Building all the models you, you have from your uh, uh, your specification, your you know the specification of your problem. Um, how does your approach scale to big problems? Because you know if you're generating loads and loads and loads of models, there will be some practical problems with that. How are you thinking about dealing with this? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a fine question. So the system certainly is not fully developed there yet. But uh, in my latest experiments, I'm using a, a data set that consists of 2 million entries. Uh, it's about taxi rides in New York a couple of years ago. And this, I can deal with a good, a good part of it, yeah? And mm, it's, but that's not because the system is so super, efficiently implemented, this is because the logic complexity is rather low. So evaluating to fixed point under stratification condition is really low complexity, even with the default negation in place, if the rules are not too complicated. So that works quite okay. If you, uh, if you, uh, uh, if you write your, your rules well, and this is what I meant by uh, controllable com complexity, yeah. Right. Um, of course, when it branches out, it it's it soon becomes very intractable. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no no doubt of, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, can... sorry. Please. Yeah, but what I, what, what I definitely will include is or will try to see how to uh, include these these indexing techniques known from first order theory improving uh, to find my terms faster. But I'm not sure how compatible that is to the Scala embedding. So there might be some some limits limits there. But the current implementation is maybe it's with kind of delta iteration or talking to Uli, it's something like what we implemented in Hypertableau many years ago, something right. along these lines. So Uli has another question. Um, is there any connection to his string reasoning? <laughs> um, it, that would be an interesting application, of course, yeah. So in this taxi rides data set that I mentioned that was given as a challenge for stream reasoning, yeah. So I definitely want to go in that direction uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. But really a proper, on a proper technical level, I, I couldn't answer that question now, other than the domain of interest overlaps, yes. I do have a, a last question by myself. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I got that wrong, but I, you said in the last slide that it would be easy to extend this to LTL, or am I wrong? <laughs> Uh, okay, what I mean is I would do um, uh, 
uh, runtime verification. So the logical models, each branch gives me my stream of events and I, and I run an LTL formula just over it. I check it. I can do that by, by an unfolding. That would be the natural way of doing that. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. This is all we have time for. Thank you very much. I know it's late there in Australia. Um, <laughs> Pleasure. Please, let's Thank you very much. The speaker. Thanks. Thank you.